Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we are filled with the awestruck wonder of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we recognize your power and your strength. And we recognize all that you want to do in us and through us. And Lord, you just ask us to put all of us into all of you so that you can do all of your purpose through us. And so Lord, as we go on a journey this month, as we go on a journey to learn about consecration and about dedication and about you doing your purpose through us, God, we just invite you into our hearts and into our minds. And Lord, thank you that a building does not define you. But Lord Jesus, you are everywhere and you are with your people wherever they gather. And God, thank you that you are with us this morning. And we look forward to what you're going to do among us and with us and through us and in us today. God, thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Hey, it's great to see all of you here this morning. And as we go through the next step, few weeks of worship, you're going to find that we're going to uh, do things a little bit differently, and uh, we're going to be including our children in, in, in many parts of our worship uh, in different ways each week, and so all of the kids that were down here singing with us earlier, I'd like to invite you to come on down again, and so you guys kind of get up from wherever you're at, come down, and and, uh, and Mrs. Woods has something, Ms. Don has something for you this morning, so... so beautiful and so handsome. You know for a while we're not going to be in a church building. And so Pastor Kyle and Mrs. Carey and your wonderful Sunday school teachers can't give you your normal Sunday school lessons. And so we're going to be doing something like this, a children's minute, every Sunday that we're here meeting at Renaissance High School. So right now I want you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine that it's very hot outside. And you've been outside playing for a long time and you're a little bit hungry and a little bit thirsty, and your mom or your dad just came outside with a blanket, and they put the blanket in the shade, and you sat down in the blanket, and your mom or dad got out a bag of pretzels, and remember you were a little bit hungry, so you're eating those pretzels. But you're out there in the hot sun, and you're eating pretzels. Raise your hand if you think you're going to get thirsty. So thank goodness mom or dad also has a picture of drink. And I want you to use your imagination, and that picture of drink can have in it whatever you want it to have. My picture would have iced tea, and so would Mrs. Sandy Isaacs. Hers would have iced tea, too. But I want you to imagine if you like orange juice, it has orange juice. If you like red Kool-Aid, it has red Kool-Aid. Whatever you like to drink. And I also want you to use your imagination right now and hold your cup. If you have a little bitty cup, you can hold it like this. If you have a great big cup, you can hold it like this. If your cup has a handle, you can hold it like this. Melanie and Heather are so thirsty, their cup is the shape of a bucket. So, now imagine that mom or dad is filling your cup up with that delicious drink. But what would happen if you tipped your cup upside down? Tip your cup upside down. And mom or dad pours that drink. Where's that drink going to go? Could be if they were standing here. Connor, would your cup have anything in it if it were upside down? It would be all over the edge of the cup and all over the floor and all over your feet and all over that blanket. In order for a pitcher and a cup to work well, they have to have the right relationship. The cup has to be the right way so all the drink can get all in. How was that little plug for your book there, Pastor? <laughs> no. Now I also want you to try this. I'm going to start slow, and then I'm going to get fast. I want you to follow me. Whatever I do, you do. I didn't know I was holding a mic. I thought I was going to get to use two hands. It's not, ooh, cool. following me. Today when Pastor Dale talks, he's going to talk mainly to the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. And some of the things he says you won't be able to understand as well. But when he talks, I don't want you, well because you're not talking, we, we, 
<laughs> they get the idea that they're in a big people church. But when he's talking, I want you to listen how he talks about a relationship. He's going to talk about a relationship with Jesus. And I want you to listen for following. Listen for those words. Relationship and follow. Are you ready to hear what he has to say? All right. Let's pray, and then I'll give him back the mic. Dear Jesus, it's a little bit hard for all of us to come and sit in the big sanctuary for a few weeks, but we're excited because it knows we know our new building's coming. Help us to listen and be as good as we can be, and thank you that it's Sunday. And why don't we all say amen with me? Amen. something with me this morning, and I'm going to say a sentence, and after I say that sentence, I'm going to invite you to repeat it with me, okay? Now, now let me teach you, it. it's really easy to remember, I think all of you can remember, it. it's just a few words, it says this, you are one decision away from a totally different life. Can you say that with me? You are one decision away from a totally different life. Let's say that again. You are one decision away from a totally different life. You know, the decisions we make in our life defines our lives. It defines our future. It defines our relationships. It defines our goals. It defines our hopes. It defines our dreams. The decisions we make are so, so critical. And as a church, they are so, so critical as well because the decisions that we make as a body will literally define our future together. And so today, we're going to talk about the importance of the decisions we make and the impact of those decisions. I hope many of you are reading uh, Mark Batterson's book, All In. And um, I just want to take a couple excerpts from this book. Um, he starts out, uh, and it captivated me how he started out the book. And it, it, it just said this, pack your coffee. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but that's a decision I'm not willing to talk about yet. Okay, I want that decision to be a long time from now. But he said this. He said, a century ago, a brand of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries. They purchased single tickets to the mission field without the return half. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings in a coffin. Because they knew wherever they went to serve in the world, they would go and they would serve their Jesus they would die there, and they would need a coffin when they died. Two of those people were William Pickett, who later became Bishop Pickett of the United Methodist Church, and a guy by the name of E. Stanley Jones. Those names may not mean anything to you, and they didn't mean anything to me until I went to, to seminary. And I went to seminary to, to study God's Word and how to preach and all that kind of stuff. But I got introduced to these guys because they had actually gone to the same seminary, Asbury Theological Seminary, that I had went to, of course, many, many years before. And while these young men were there, they made a key decision in their life. They decided to be one of those missionaries, like Mark Batterson was talking about at the beginning of the book. They were the kind of guys that followed God, and when they followed God, they packed their coffins, and they didn't even know where they were going to go. They just went and they said, send us into the world wherever you want to send us. And they were part of the United Methodist Church. And it so happens at that time that the United Methodist Church sent these two young guys from Asbury Theological Seminary with all their earthly belongings. And they said goodbye to their parents and their relatives for what they knew would be the last time. And they got shipped off to a distant country. And the distant country that they got shipped off to was India. And they went to India and they began what was called the India Inland Mission. And they began to preach for the very first time the gospel of Jesus Christ in a community and in a culture that had never heard of Jesus. One of the men that came to hear E. Stanley Jones preach the gospel of Jesus Christ was named Ahali. And Ahali went to hear and Ahali was converted and he asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart. And as a result of that, he made a decision to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And then he got married and had a family. And he had a son. And his son's name was Sharish. And Pastor Sharish last week prayed for us 
that God would bless us as we go on our journey. And many people from this church, from Waypoint, have traveled to India. And you've met Pastor Sharish. And now Pastor Sharish's son, Abishai, leads one of the largest ministries that rescues women that are kidnapped and taken into the sex slave industry in Mumbai. It's one of the areas in the world that that, that trade is just rampant. And he has an organization that goes in and actually rescues those women out of the sex trade, brings them to a safe house, and gives them medical care, emotional care, and spiritual care. Wow. One decision by a couple of guys going to seminary 100 years ago all of a sudden impacts what Waypoint Free Methodist Church is doing around the world. It's amazing how important our decisions are. Our decisions determine our future. And today, it's great to be here, and it's awesome to be here. But today is going to be a little bit different kind of message. Because today is going to be pretty serious because we're going to be making some decisions. We're going to be making some decisions about our future, and we're going to be making decisions that will define our future, and we're going to be making decisions that are going to determine our future, so we better make the right decisions. Mark Batterson goes on in the very beginning of his book on page 13, and he says this, When did we start believing that God wants to send us to safe places to do easy things? That faithfulness is holding the front. When did we start believing that playing it safe is always the safest? When did we start believing that there is any greater privilege than sacrifice? When did we stop believing that radical is anything but normal? Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates. And when I read that, I thought, what about me? What about us? I mean, as the kids learn today, and, and as Mark Batterson says in All In, sometimes we get the gospel upside down. Sometimes we think that the Christian life is about God serving us and God meeting my needs and me praying to God when I have a problem and me praying to God when I have a, a mountain to climb and me saying, God, will you be with me and God, will you help me and God, will you protect me and God, will you keep me safe and God, will you keep me comfortable and God, will you provide for my needs and God, will you make everything work together just so smoothly in my life when if we read the gospel, that's not what God is inviting us to do. God is inviting us to surrender our life and go into the dangerous. God is inviting us to say, I don't want to live a life of comfort. I don't want to live a life of ease. I don't want to live a life that's easy. God, I want to go into the frontier and I want to go where it's dangerous. I want to be with a group that goes where it's dangerous. I want to be with a group that doesn't play it safe. I want to be with a group that doesn't go to the comfortable and the known and the existing and those things that, that we can do, quite frankly, on our own and we don't even need God. God is inviting us to make decisions that will transform our world. And if we make decisions that will transform our world, it will mean that every one of us will have to pack our coffins. Because it will mean a sacrifice beyond anything that any of us have known to this point. Now, if you have your Bibles with you today, I'd like you to turn to Exodus chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. And we're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to learn a lesson that, that I learned when, um, when I was a small boy. My, my father was a pastor, and one of the jobs that, that my father had was to travel to, to different churches. And um, he had the responsibility of, of appointing pastors to different various churches um, around uh, the eastern half of Michigan. And when he would appoint a new pastor to a church, my dad would go and he would do what was called an installation service. And um, my dad then would preach a message about what it means to follow Christ. And as a young boy, I would go to my dad and I heard many of these messages. And believe it or not, he could have, but he didn't preach the same message everywhere he went. He would create a new message for the people where, where he went, even though they, they wouldn't hear him preach again, but, but he did. And I actually, as a young boy, 
I remember one of those messages. I don't know why I remember it, but I remember it, and somehow God put it on my heart. And I think God was putting it on my heart because God was forming me as a young boy. I mean, I was probably six or seven years old. And I remember these verses that my dad used in that message. I remember what he said. And as I was reading all in, I couldn't help but think of this passage and this commitment. Now, I know the screen is a little bit hard to read this morning. We're good. This is our first week, and you're all going to have grace on us this week, right? Okay? Say yes. Okay? Yes. Okay? Next week, we'll have a, it'll be a little bit better, we hope. But if you can read this, or if you have your Bibles, I want us to read this out loud, and then I'm going to give you some background of this scriptural passage. Okay? Here we go. The servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and do not want to go free. Then his master must take him before the judge. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an owl. Then he will be his servant for life. Let me give you the context of that verse. If I am a, a, a young man with a family, and I don't have a lot of resources. I don't have money to buy a tract of land. I will go to a, a rich landowner. Mike, will you be a rich landowner? Okay, come on up here, okay? All right, this is a rich landowner that I'm going to go to, okay? And I'm going to say, Mike, I know you own a lot of property in Clarkston. I mean, you are loaded, okay? All right? Okay, this isn't true. This is like a, you know, we're, we're role playing here, right? Because you don't have a lot of property in Clarkston, do you? Just the house behind the old church. There you go. But, but you've got acres and acres of property. So I would go to him and say, you know, I have this young family. And I know that, you know, you've got 100 acres on I-75 and Dixie Highway. Yeah, you wish you could. Okay. And, uh, and, and I would like um, to work for you for the next seven years. And whatever I produce on that piece of property... You will have 100% of the profits. In fact, you can tell me what to plant. And I'll plant it. I'll work the ground. If you want me to grade livestock, then all of the livestock will be yours. And then, at the end of seven years, at the year of Jubilee, if I have been a faithful servant and I've kept my word to Mike, then he will keep his word to me. And after that seven years, he will give me that 100 acres for my family. So that's how I can get that land without having any money and then provide for my family for generations. Huh. So we strike a deal, we shake hands, and thank you, I'll call you in seven years, okay? <laughs> um, so what happens, the next seven years I work really hard, and I work for that land, and I plant crops, and I give all the money to Mike so he can become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier and buy more land and more land and more land and more land. And then it comes down to that point where I've done my service, I've done my contract to him. So then he has a responsibility to give me the land, although I can say, you know what? Mike has been so good to us, and he has been such a good master. If I go out on my own, man, that's a risk, because then, then I don't know what's going to happen. But if I'm under Mike's umbrella, he's going to take care of me. He's going to watch over me. So I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to make a decision that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be his servant. And so then I would go to the, the elders in the temple, and I would go to them, and we would make this proclamation together that I was going to be Mike's bond servant. And literally what they would do in public, they would take my earlobe, and they would put it on a post, and they would drive a hole in my earlobe, and Mike would have a, a, a signature ring that he would put in wax to, to sign a document to say it's his. And they would take the image of that, that ring, and they would put it on an earring, and they would put it in my ear and it would signify that I no longer belong to myself, but I belong to Mike. And for the rest of my life, I would not own anything. I would not have anything. I would not make decisions. I would not direct my life. I would be in complete submission to Mike and whatever he wanted to do with me and whatever he asked me to do because I was his bond servant. I had made the decision that no matter what, I'm going to follow and I'm going to do what my master has asked me to do. 
It's like that decision that God wants us to make. And sometimes I think, and I agree with Mark Batterson and all in, that sometimes we ask God to follow us instead of us following God. And we say, God, come and, and bless me. God, come and help me. And God, work in my life the way that I have designed it and I am directing it. And God, I want your blessing on me. Instead of saying, God, I'm packing my coffin and I'm jumping in and whatever you want in my life, I'm willing to do. Think of this. Batterson has said this. This is our fundamental problem. We try to do God's job for him. We want to do amazing things for God, and that seems noble, but sometimes we get it backward. God wants to do amazing things for us, and that's His job, not ours. Our job is consecration. That's it. If we do our job, God will most certainly do His. Now, before I tell you what consecration is, let me tell you what it isn't. It's not going to church. It's not daily devotions. It's not fasting during Lent. It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not sharing your faith. It's not giving God the tithe. It's not repeating the sinner's prayer. It's not volunteering for ministry. It's not leading a small group. It's not raising your hands in worship. It's not going on a mission trip. All of those things are good things, but all of those things are not consecration. What consecration means is to set yourself apart. To say the purpose of my life is to do whatever God has called me to do. And whatever's in my life, whatever my life is about, I'm willing to put it in the coffin and I'm willing to shut the door and I'm willing to walk away because I'm a consecrated person to God's plan in my life. That means I follow God. God doesn't follow me. You see, if God follows me, I say, oh God, here's my plans, and, and let me lay them out to you, and then God, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to say, God, will you bless the plans that I have made? That's inviting God to follow us. Consecration is saying, God, I don't know what all the plans you have are for my life. God, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold, and I don't know what the next day's going to hold, or the next week, or the next month, but God, I am willing to submit to your plan into your way, however you want to do it, God, I'm willing. That's what consecration is. And you know what? If we read the scripture, the scripture is full of people who have consecrated their lives to God. Let's go to another scripture in the Old Testament. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. And, and just like last time, I'd like us to read this out loud together. Can we read this out loud together? Here we go. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son who you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on my mom. I will show you. You know the rest of that story, right? Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain. He even puts him on the altar of sacrifice. And then God intervenes and stops it. But let's say... He didn't know the end of the story. And let's say you were Abraham. And God had promised you for a hundred years a family. And you hadn't had a family. And finally, you have a son to carry on your lineage. To carry on your heritage for generations and generations and generations and generations. And imagine if God had come to you and said, Take your only son and place him on an altar and sacrifice him. Would you do it? That's consecration. Consecration is being people who say, we want to listen to God's voice. We don't want to be safe. We don't want to go to the known. We want to just say, God, we are. And God, whatever you call us to do, however you call us to change, wherever you call us to go, Whatever you call us to do as individuals and as a body, God, the answer is already yes. Because we are people who are consecrated. We are people who have given ourselves wholly and fully and completely to God. I recalled something as I was reading all in, and it, it took me back again 
to my seminary days. It took me back to the most boring class I ever had in seminary. Okay? This is a school, nothing is boring here, okay? But in my school, we had some boring stuff. And the most boring class I had, now some of you would probably disagree with me, but to me, you know, I'm a young seminary student. I want to get out there in the world. I want to go make a difference. I want to get in the pastoral ministry, get this obstacle of seminary out of the way. And I had to take a church history class. And we're talking about the church in the 1400s. And I'm thinking, who in the pew cares about the church in the 1400s? Let's learn about how to reach people for Jesus. But I had to take the class because I didn't take it. I didn't graduate. So I was in that class. And then we got up to some of the history of the Methodist movement. And all of a sudden, I started to really like this class. Okay? And Mark Batterson put something in there that actually came from John Wesley. John Wesley talked about consecration. The early Methodist movement was a movement of people who were willing to do anything for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Christian church in America, much of it was settled by the early Methodist circuit riders. They get on a horse and they go from city to city to city. And they literally packed their coffins in England and came to America to tell America about Jesus. In those early Methodists, here was a creed that they together as a body would give themselves to God. Now the language is old, but the message is true. Let me read it to you. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Now those early Methodists would say this as part of their worship. And they would ingrain it in their lives and it wouldn't be something they just said. It would actually be something that they did and they embraced and they did so that they could draw the line and so that they could say they were different. Just like Abraham. 